This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. China's president's historic state visit to Panama is now underway. World leaders urge to do more to avert climate change. And Italy cuts ties with Egypt's parliament over mysterious death of a student in 2016. Hello and welcome to Africa Live on CGTN with me, Beatrice Marshall in Nairobi. We'll bring you the details on those stories in just a moment, but first, Uche Okoronko with the day's business headlines. Uche. Thank you, Beatrice. And here's a look at what's coming up on Africa Live Biz. Supporters of South African opposition party EFF vandalize Vodacom shops. And the IMF releases a $172 million loan for Sierra Leone. Of course, all that coming up within the program. For now, it's back to you, Idris. Uche, thank you. And uh, let's begin in Panama, where Chinese President Xi Jinping has arrived in Panama. This is the first trip of its kind since uh, diplomatic relations were established last year. Panama's President Juan Carlos Varela and his wife welcomed the Chinese leader with a grand ceremony in the capital, Panama City. Zhang Yi Xiaoyi has the latest. Panama is a buzz with excitement. That's because of the arrival of some important new guests from another hemisphere. Greeted by the famously warm embrace of Latino hospitality, Xi Jinping touched down in Panama City on Sunday. The Chinese leader was quick to pass on sincere greetings on behalf of the Chinese people. He said that with the now mutual recognition of the One China principle, the two countries' relationship has turned over a new chapter. The president made clear he was looking forward to talks with his Panamanian counterpart, Juan Carlos Vilela. We share the same value, values about the rule of law, about the fight, fight against corruption, about working for better days for our people. So I think it's a great opportunity to bring both uh, government and countries together. And we expect a lot of uh, uh, treaties to be signed, agreements to be signed of cooperation in the, the different areas, energy, transportation, uh, education, and, and I feel this is going to be a very advantage situation for both countries. The two countries established diplomatic relations in June of last year, after Panama cut its ties with Taiwan. Ahead of his visit, President Xi heaped praise on the blossoming relations in a column he penned in one of Panama's most widely read newspapers. He wrote that China and Panama were natural partners for cooperation under the Belt and Road Initiative. Panama serves as the gateway for Chinese goods bound for Latin America. Chinese ships are currently the second most frequent users of the Panama Canal, following those from the United States. China is also the top supplier of goods to a vital Panamanian free trade zone column. With the traditional ties that reach back more than a century and a half, the two countries are now forging closer bounds than ever, with even more cooperation still on the horizon. Jiang Shaoyi, CGT. The head of the United Nations says the world is not doing nearly enough to prevent catastrophic climate change. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres issued the warning as nations gathered in Poland for the last environmental conference. They are supposed to be charting a way for mankind to avert a runway global warming. Even as we witness devastating climate impacts causing havoc across the world, we are still not doing enough nor moving fast enough to prevent irreversible and catastrophic climate disruption. Nor are we doing enough to capitalize on the enormous social, economic and then environmental opportunities of climate action. Meanwhile, leaders from around the world have arrived for the ceremonial opening of the climate conference in southern Poland. Over the next two weeks, they're supposed to add detail to their vague plans to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Three years ago, they agreed in Paris to keep global warming well below 2 degrees Celsius. But scientists say their commitments are nowhere near enough to achieve that. And let's reflect now on Africa's role in the fight against climate change. We will do that with CGTN correspondents from the industrialized economies on the continent. In Johannesburg, Angela Coppola is joining us from there. In Lagos, 
Deji Badmus and Adel Mahroui is in Egypt's capital, Cairo. Adel, first to you though, give us a rundown of Egypt's legislation around climate change and how it has been affected. Egypt has been taking the, uh, the um, attempts and the regulations in general to work climate change is a bit more, uh, they're taking it a bit more serious. What the country is trying to do is actually um, setting a brand or, and a series of legislations for the country itself to abide to. Um, the Ministry of Environment uh, in general has been given uh, powerful legislations uh, through which um, it has become more influential and its um, advisory role in the government has become more um, a must to most uh, government organizations. Now there is no project that Egypt approves or studies uh, without having the environmental implica implications of that project uh, being studied thoroughly and a detailed presentation must be given to the Prime Minister and the President uh, depending on the magnitude of that project. These are some of the um, new regulations that the, uh, the new Egyptian administration under President El Sisi have been trying to take um, throughout the projects that ha Egypt has been quite expanding um, in uh, the recent years. Egypt has went on for um, petroleum and natural gas explorations in the Mediterranean. Um, it has done expansions in the Red Sea uh, through uh, the expansions that has led in the Suez Canal project and the industrial and trade zones that it is establishing on the shores of the Red Sea all uh, are quite essential projects economically, but again, um, they can be quite influential in terms of environment impact. And that's what Egypt has been moving forward to. Um, just recently, the right. government of uh, uh, the Ministry of Environment, sorry, has been taking steps to measure um, the carbon dioxide emissions and the lead emissions from vehicles. So there are many procedures Egypt is moving forward for. And Deji, Nigeria experienced a flood disasters affecting 12 states and 327,000 people, as well as 60 hectares of farmland across the state. Has this been attributed to the climate change phenomenon by experts? And what are they saying? Absolutely, Beatrice, you're, you're quite right. Most of the experts who have uh, spoken on the issue of flooding in this country would quickly tell you that climate change is actually responsible. We've had um, more than enough rainfall over the past, since last year, as a matter of fact. Uh, I think since 2012, when we had the worst flooding in this country, uh, we, we've been having heavier than usual rainfall. And uh, this year alone, it, it was heavy. As a matter of fact, as we speak in the country today, we're supposed to be in the dry season, but it is still raining in some parts of the country. So um, no question at all from experts that um, Climate change is actually responsible uh, for the uh, huge amount of flooding we've actually had in this. Of course, you always would have um, the human-made problems like the issue of poor drainage, blockage of drainage and all of that. But uh, the fact is that uh, climate change, we're having heavier than usual rainfall. Sea levels are, are rising here in this country. And um, I mean, rivers are busting their banks. I mean, dams are getting filled up and water, uh, you know, have to be released from some of these dams causing this huge flooding but at the end of the day everything is tied back uh, to climate change because um, as i said the country is now having heavier than usual rainfall and uh, experts say climate change is actually at the bottom of nigeria's flooding crisis right uh, angelo in 2016 the southern african development community declared a regional disaster i'm talking about the el nino induced a drought this was confirmed as the result of changing climate patterns tell us the kind of destruction this has caused beatrice this el nino was one of the worst in 50 years that was experienced in this region it was caused or and in fact it led to an intense drought in the southern africa and it had a devastating impact on the region's food security the rainy season was probably the driest they say in 35 years and affected large parts of zimbabwe malawi Zambia, South Africa, Mozambique, Botswana and Madagascar, added to which some 70% of the region's population are and, uh, and were then dependent on agriculture and the drought had a huge impact on their lives and their livelihoods. 
For example, maize production in South Africa was down around 25% for that 2016 uh, harvesting season, which meant more maize had to be imported into South Africa, which affected its exports to its neighbours. Specifically, I'm thinking here of Zimbabwe, which led to additional tension. Fortunately, though, the weather did turn and the rain did come during the next season and there were better sized crops that uh, were harvested, but it did expose the precarious nature of the agricultural sector in low rainfall areas in our region, Beatrice. Right, Adele, to you though, analysts predict the next world war will likely be over the dwindling resource of water. Now, Egypt and Ethiopia have a major disagreement. So Sudan is in the middle, and the common denominator of all that is the Nile River. What is the latest on this issue? Well, um, the talks are still ongoing. Um, what has been going on is that Egypt has been following up closely the uh, latest um, developments in the Grand Renaissance uh, Dam project, the stall in the program of reconstruction that has been alarming Ethiopia. Um, and the talks are still proceeding. There haven't finalized the details of differences yet. They are trying to take consultancy of several international um, consultancy firms. Uh, but. Uh, what seems to be apparent recently is that the leaders of the three countries, Egypt, Ethiopia and Sudan, have been agreeing um, that um, none, no harm shall affect any of the three with respect of development in all countries. But these differences may not have uh, any significance with the um, uh, reports coming out that climate change would affect um, the volume of water in uh, the Nile. Uh, rains in some reports are expected to drop by 11%. Egypt is one of the most affected countries of global warming because it has very limited resources of water. It depends mainly on the River Nile and with temperatures, daily temperatures expected to rise from 1.1 to 3.5 degrees, it means that the evaporation of water will be higher and therefore for estimated that Egypt's share um, after these evaporation due to global warming will decrease by 8.5 billion cubic meters annually with the water evaporating from the Nasser Lake just before Egypt's um, dam. So climate change in general might be uh, one of the incentives that make these three countries move forward quickly and try to find compromise because the later they, uh, they, they wait for these solutions, the more effect and maybe the climate change process in general uh, would be faster than whatever changes that they need to do. And this is what one of the main factors that the three countries are still trying to investigate is the environmental impact uh, on them uh, due to the projects of building dams along the Nile River. Right. Uh, and Deji, President Buhari is one of the delegates at the COP24 in Poland. But does Nigeria have a coherent national green growth policy and strategy that it is currently implementing? Absolutely. Um, as we speak today, Nigeria is currently implementing its, um, that's the nationally determined contributions now. Nigeria, for instance, aims to um, cut down gas emission now by about 20% within the next 15 years and by 40% with the support of uh, the international community. Uh, that document, of course, um, the, the strategy is in place. Uh, it's called the sectoral uh, uh, strategy. It's in place and um, the stakeholders actually met sometime uh, this year, uh, sometime in October this, I mean, sometime in July this year and uh, came up with that document. So we're now at the implementation stage, but um, I can tell you for sure that the implementation is going all too, all too smoothly. Uh, there still needs to be um, a lot of work in terms of communication now, communicating to the people to really understand what the document uh, is all about and what the plan is and communicating as well to the private sector, that, needs, that still needs to be done. Nigeria is not doing well in that regard because I can tell you that um, not everyone is carried along and that's one area that the government would need to improve on to ensure that uh, it's able to meet uh, its own target of this uh, nationally determined uh, contributions. But we also have legislation in place and uh, the government seems to be bent on ensuring that uh, you know it, it fulfills, it meets its targets and don't forget that when you look at what is happening in the Lake Chad Basin country, Nigeria is seriously affected. Uh, the receding Lake Chad, of course, has been blamed on climate change. So it's basically in the interest of Nigeria to ensure that um, it fulfills its own target now, especially in the area of uh, you know, gas emission, agriculture, uh, power and transport as well. So uh, I would say, well, Nigeria may not be on course, but right. uh, at least it's got something going. 
And uh, let's wrap it with, up with you, Angelo, because Cape Town saw the worst drought in recent months and the situation has gotten better. But would you say the situation was averted by people adapting or the country's green growth policies that have been loaded by environmentalists? Well, look, the situation has improved to such an extent that the authorities last week eased those water restrictions to another level. Um, so they're now, people are now allowed about 110 litres per day per person. And that's because of the rains that have come and the dam levels in the catchment areas are now a lot higher than they were uh, probably in recent times. They're at 70% levels compared to 35% last year. But looking back at the drought, Captonians didn't really have a choice. The city imposed hefty fines. Uh, there were premium rates for overusage of water. Uh, it forced people to think about water consumption differently. So that consumption dropped dramatically and over time water saving habits were ingrained in most people. It became a way of life and a conversation topic obviously and this drought hit them on a personal level. The country's policies had little to do with the change of, of habit. Uh, I have family who live in Cape Town and they were very proud about telling me how much water or how little water they'd actually used and how much they actually needed. So it appears there's been a change in consumption habits which could be permanent and it's something that we do need in our water-scarce countries, Beatrice. All right, uh, Angelo Coppola for us there in Johannesburg, Deji Badmus in Lagos, and Adel Mahrui in Cairo to you all. Uh, thank you. Italy has surprised Egypt with an escalation in political tension by summoning the Egyptian ambassador to Rome and cutting ties with the parliament. Italy says it is concerned with the procedures of the ongoing investigations over the torture and death of Italian citizen Giulio Regini, who died in 2016. Adel Mahrui joins us again with more. Egypt insists its investigation and the death of Italian researcher Giulio Regini are completely transparent. Cairo says it has accepted all Rome's demands. The only exception was to include named policemen on the suspects list which Italy requested more than once. The Egyptian side clarified that no solid evidence have been found to relate them to Regini's torture and eventually death almost three years ago. In response, Italy's lower house has cut ties with the Egyptian parliament. We were surprised by the Italian parliament speaker's decision. We were astonished. It's an unjustified decision and unfortunate. We have eight Egyptian citizens who faced crimes that sometimes are worse than regimes. There are issues of great concern to us, but it won't lead us to break ties. We told the Italians we must differentiate between Regini's case and the nature of our bilateral relations. Egyptian politicians believe that the Italian parliament's decision won't greatly impact bilateral relations. Egypt and Italy are countries that cannot afford to cut ties. Both of them have huge common interests, whether it's economic or regional crisis. Egypt and Italy have integral roles in Libya and in battling illegal migration. I believe that the Italian parliament speaker's decision won't have great effect. It won't affect the bilateral relations. Giulio Regini disappeared on January 25, 2016, when Egypt was marking the fifth anniversary of its popular uprising that forced longtime ruler Hosni Mubarak to resign. Days later, Regini's body was found ditched near a highway. International criticism has surrounded Egypt over Regini's death. Because of that crisis, some officials say the country has been abused for political gains. It's why many here insist that Cairo's benefit is to find the perpetrators and put a final end to this controversial case. Adel Mahroui, ZGTN, Cairo. You're watching Africa Live, still ahead on the program. We'll take a look at how the French government is dealing with violent protests that rocked Paris in the past few days. And new laws frustrate commuters in Kenya. Find out why after the break. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen? for yourself. If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories, 
are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. French President Emmanuel Macron is now on damage control mode. Days of protests in the street of Paris has forced him as Prime Minister Eduardo Felipe to meet with heads of political parties and representatives of the so-called Yellow Vests in an attempt to defuse tensions that erupted into violent protests. For the latest, let's now go straight to Paris where CGTN Stéphane de Fries is standing by. Stéphane, give us the latest on the political intervention sanctioned by the President. Any progress there? Well, not really. Today, the Prime Minister, Edouard Philippe, received all the leaders of the political parties in France. Uh, some of those leaders uh, claimed that Emmanuel Macron has to resign. Others want new elections for the Parliament. But so far, the government is not giving in to those demands. Uh, there was a meeting planned tomorrow with representatives of the Yellow Vests, but uh, they are now cancelling one by one. One of the problems, of course, is the fact that these Yellow Vests are not organised. They're not affiliated to any political parties or to to unions, uh, so it makes it extremely difficult for the French government to negotiate with them. Stefan, a violent scenes including the looting of businesses came out of Paris over the past few days. Would you say criminal elements then took over a genuine protest against government's tax laws? Well, there were indeed uh, uh, criminal elements uh, um, present during the manifestation, and, and that's pretty common in, in, in France, actually. During protest marches, there are always a couple of hooligans, you could call them as well, who try to uh, seek the confrontation with the police, with the riot police, always very, very present uh, during uh, mo protest marches here in France. Uh, but on Saturday, it was really extreme. There were over a thousand people, uh, uh, well, th that's the estimate of the police, who were there just to create riots. Uh, they were also extremely um, flexible. They were moving in small groups through parts of the city centre of Paris and that made it very difficult for the uh, French police forces uh, to, to contain them. Um, they were also cheered by more peaceful protesters, so yellow vests who didn't want to destroy anything. Um, so it was a very tense and chaotic situation uh, where the police lost uh, complete control. And analysts have described these protests as tensions between the metropolitan elite and the rural poor. Is that a fair assessment, though? Well, yes, up to a point. Uh, of course, France is a very big country, and uh, when you go to the countryside, uh, for instance, in the north or the middle of the country, um, it's really empty. Uh, villages have no more post offices, no more schools. Uh, basically, only very old people stay in those villages. So those people really feel left behind. Uh, train lines are being closed. Um, it's, it's, it's a pretty um, desolate area um, on the countryside. And now um, there is also a large part of the population who live in the uh, what we call the peri-urban uh, areas, that means the smaller cities, so still in cities, but even in those cities people feel left behind. And then of course there's the huge uh, centralism in France. Everything happens, everything is being decided in Paris and, and, and politicians uh, are seen as arrogant, uh, people who do not understand what's going on in the rest of the country. So that really does play a role. But then again, it's very difficult to characterize the Yellow Vest because they have all kinds of different complaints. They are from all kinds of groups of the population. So this makes it really difficult to manage the situation. But what is clear though, is that the President Emmanuel Macron is facing already the worst crisis in his political career. All right, Stéphane de Vries joining us there from Paris. Let's now go to Tunisia, where the Council of Ministers has approved a bill providing for gender equality when it comes to inheritance. Women's rights activists have defended the project, which will be discussed in Parliament this month. A cabinet meeting chaired by President of the Republic, Beji Qadisipsi, approved a draft organic law supplementing the personal status code. Qadi Sipsi proposed on August 13, 2017, inheritance equality for women and announced the creation of the Committee on Individual Freedoms and Equality, Kulib. According to the Constitution, Tunisia is a civil state based on three principles, citizenship, the people's will, and finally, the supremacy of the law. Article 21 of the Constitution 
imposes equality between men and women. The Colib released a report on June 12, 2018, which includes a set of proposals to revamp the personal service code, particularly in connection to equal inheritance rights and the consolidation of individual liberties. Colib is chaired by Bushra Abel Haj Ahmida, a lawyer and a member of the Tunisian parliament, who's accepted public and off closed door criticism. The story of the man and the the Muslim the report unleashed controversy from conservative currents who reject any reform. We respect Islam, but anything is subject to interpretation. Religion should not be mixed with politics. Women are victims of injustice. Equal inheritance is a constitutional right. This daily show at a local radio station, EFM in Tunisia, features five of the most talented women in the North African state. Naima is a journalist and a women's rights activist. She signed a petition to support the equal inheritance law. My dad and his sister opted for equal inheritance without any family conflict. Tunisian women are avant-gardists. Tunisia continues its path-breaking role in the Arab Muslim world. I'm for 100% equality between men and women. We have the same economic and social rights. Following the release of the Kalib report, a wave of protests hit Tunisia. The parliament is still divided on whether equal inheritance bill should be adopted at a plenary session. A few months ago, hundreds of women took to the streets in the Tunisian capital to demand equal inheritance rights, a subject often seen as taboo in the Arab and Muslim world. Tunisia grants women more rights than other countries in the region. To Kenya now, where commuters in the capital Nairobi were forced to walk to work on Monday after a new directive banning public transportation, transport vehicles dropping off passengers into the city centre came into force. The local government says the new directive will ease congestion in the CBD, but as CGTN's Robert Nagila tells us, it seems it is too early to place the ban into practice. For the second time in less than a month, millions of the capital's residents were forced to work to work. A new directive by the county government has banned public transport vehicles accessing the central business district. All public transport vehicles are now required to drop off their passengers on the outskirts of the CBD. But without alternative transport into the city centre, many commuters were left frustrated. Hey, plus two hours, eh? because I've been looking for mat since morning. They should reverse their decision because many people are suffering. They should have first planned for buses to ferry people into town and back to the outskirts. Actually, I think it's a, it's a good thing because you see now in town the congestion will ease and yeah, I think it's a good thing. However, instead of reducing congestion, the ban had the opposite effect with tailbacks for miles around the city. Inevitably, tempers flared. They should have banned personal vehicles instead, even for one day, and see the difference. Now everyone has brought out their personal vehicles. This is normally a two-way street, but has now been turned into one. Now, the reason the traffic is such a mess, despite the ban on public transport into the central business district, is because the county government has yet to create enough parking spaces and bus stamina for all these vehicles. Nairobi's governor has asked for patience and says the ban is a way of keeping residents fit. But the city's Senate representative has moved to court to block the ban. We have children, we have elderly, we have persons with disability, we have blind people. How do you just wake up and come up with such a rule without having provided alternative means, yet it is your county government that is supposed to provide for transport? Armed police were deployed at all entry points into the city. But unless a court revises the ban, Nairobi's commuters will have to walk to access the city center. Robert Nagila, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya.
South Sudan's government says it is containing the yellow fever outbreak in the western part of the country near the border with the Democratic Republic of Congo. Juba says there has not been any deaths yet as a result of the outbreak. South Sudan declared an outbreak of yellow fever last week after one person was diagnosed with the virus. According to the World Health Organization uh, regulations, any single case of yellow fever of, or of any hemorrhagic fever is considered as an outbreak. So what we have now is an outbreak of a yellow fever. So uh, what, what else has the government done to try to contain the situation? Yeah, wh what we have done is we have reactivated our yellow fever response team. Already in place we have infrastructure for Ebola, which more, is more or less the same as what you need for yellow fever. So it was easy to reactivate our yellow fever team working together alongside with the Ebola team at the border. There's already a screening, uh, uh, screening center which can pick up any yellow fever, not necessarily Ebola alone. So um, what we have done is uh, those who were in contact with him have been identified and uh, they are being monitored. And we have also advised the people living in the village uh, not to travel uh, outside the village unless it is absolutely necessary and must be known that they are traveling and to where they are going. That must be known to us. We have gone out also to inform the public and educate them on the importance of reporting any suspicious fever or if there is persistent fever and malaria has been excluded, then it should be reported immediately. We are advising our people that you should not panic. We are not banning travel. Uh, between us and the Congo or to any other country. But we are telling them when you are traveling, you must ensure that you have been vaccinated and carry your yellow fever card. Mm, business should go on as usual. Those who are trading with South Sudan should not uh, be scared. It is absolutely under control and there's no fear whatsoever. Individuals wanting to visit their relatives in or outside South Sudan are also uh, encouraged to do so. Those who are coming in, make sure that you have your vaccination history up to date, that you have your yellow fever card as a confirmation of your vaccination. If you haven't been vaccinated or if you can't remember that you have been vaccinated recently and you don't have or within the last 10 years or you don't have your yellow fever card, you can take another vaccination. It doesn't harm. Those who are traveling, make sure that you have been vaccinated. Say that you don't also pose a risk to others. Global health experts are calling on U.S. President Donald Trump to allow U.S. government disease specialists to return to Northeastern Democratic Republic of Congo to fight Ebola. They are seen as some of the world's most experienced but have been sidelined for weeks, ordered away because of State Department security concerns. Our correspondent Giles Gibson reports. Two top medical journals here in the United States are calling on the Trump administration to send American personnel back into the worst affected areas in the DRC. A group of experts writing in the Journal of the American Medical Association said uh, it is in US national interest to control outbreaks before they escalate into a crisis. Uh, another piece in the New England Journal of Medicine said, given the worsening of the outbreak, we believe it's essential that these security concerns be addressed and that CDC staff return to the field. Now, the Centers for Disease Control, or the CDC as it's known, hasn't provided any response to uh, either of these articles. However, the State Department has said that uh, experts from the CDC and the US Agency for International Aid Development are working closely with international partners to stop the outbreak. Uh, due to security fears, uh, US personnel have been confined to the capital of the DRC, uh, Kinshasa, uh, which is more than 1,500 kilometers away uh, from some of the worst affected areas in the northeast of the country. Uh, and also only two weeks ago, administration officials said that there are currently no plans to redeploy personnel. Giles Gibson, CGTN, Washington. Well, let's now go to Uche for the latest business news. Uche. Thanks, Beatrice. And coming up on Africa Live Biz. Supporters of South African opposition party EFF vandalize Vodacom shops. 
and the IMF releases a $172 million loan for Syria Leon. Africa is the nexus of enterprise and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects just in terms of revenues from taxes alone $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business weekdays at this time on CGTN. You don't find the stories of North Africa by sitting on the sidelines. You've got to get out, go there, and you'll find them. In the bazaars of Casablanca. Among the crowds in Cairo. Who come to visit Cairo, the ancient capital of Egypt. Along the waters of the Nile. Along the sands of the Sahara. No one else will take you where we can in North Africa. No one else will show you what it's all about. CGTN, see the difference. Vodacom Group has shut down some of its South African franchise stores following a series of raids by alleged members of the opposition party Economic Freedom Fighters. Now, the mobile operator shops were vandalized following protests related to an image depicting the party's leaders, Julius Malema and Floyd Shivambu, as abusers of democracy. Now, the images were used in a presentation by Corruption Watch Chairman Mavuso Msimang during an event sponsored by Vodacom. The company has maintained that Mavuso's statements are his own and that they respect a freedom of expression. Now it also it has also condemned any form of violent behavior. Of course EFF has denied any involvement in the incidents. It argues that the disruptions are being done independently by unhappy South Africans. Meanwhile, the International Monetary Fund has approved a new $172 million loan program for Sierra Loan. Now, the loan will help the country combat its rising inflation and a flat economic growth. The 43-month agreement follows a previous $240 million financing plan that was suspended in February last this year. Now, IMF has reclassified Sierra Leone as a high risk for debt distress as a result of the economic slowdown. The nation's economic growth has declined from 6.3% in 2016 to an estimated 3.75% this year. And Qatar says it will terminate its membership in OPEC beginning January 1st after more than 57 years. Qatar Energy Minister Saad Sharida al Kabi says the decision reflects Qatar's desire to focus on boosting its natural gas production from about 77 million tons to 110 million per year. Now, Saad has denied that the withdrawal is due to the ongoing blockade of Qatar by OPEC countries, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. While Qatar is one of OPEC's smallest oil producers, it is the world's biggest supplier of liquefied natural gas. Well, let's go to Tanzania now, where President John Magufuli has criticized multilateral financing agencies for imposing... The Tanzanian president was commissioning a water project funded by the African Development Bank in Arusha. Now, the current project will more than triple the water supply to the fast-expanding Arusha city to 200 million litres per day when it is completed in 2020. The president is confident that Tanzania has enough resources to pay back those loans. Let's move on to China now. The government has welcomed the outcome of the G20 summit, which was held at the weekend in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Now, China's foreign ministry spokesperson, Gang Shuang, says that the event brought confidence and energy to the international markets. All sides at the summit discussed major economic issues and sent an important message through the G20 declaration which has injected confidence and energy into international markets. 
China believes this summit will help promote economic development, safeguard the multilateral trading system, improve global economic governance, and help deal with climate change. Meanwhile, Zimbabwe and China are keen to expand their bilateral trade in line with FOCAC agreements and the One Belt, One Road initiative. China has pledged to continue to be an important trading partner for Zimbabwe and a major source of investment and tech transfer. Now, bilateral trade between Zimbabwe and China has exceeded the $1 billion mark since 2015. The two countries are working on further increasing the span of investment to continue to enjoy win-win relations. Following China's recent drive to boost trade with African countries at the last FOCAC summit, Zimbabwe stands to benefit from expansion on trade circles. For us, China is a, it's quite a big market. If, even if you look at the current trade we have with China, it's around 800 million. And 50% uh, of that is mainly tobacco. And uh, the, the trade in value-added goods and services is, is quite limited. So, so the focus is to go that route. We hope... Uh, the entrepreneurs from the two sides could tap into the potential of the good policies, good economy, and also the good government. These are all your resources. I hope that you could make good use of it and come to invest here in Zimbabwe and you could develop the cooperation. Zimbabwe is eager to exploit opportunities in all its prime sectors in the regional SADC and Comesa markets. We look forward to export other agriculture and manufactured goods in the near future. We are glad to note that Zimbabwean flowers have now found a market in China, with demand still growing. Further efforts are underway to facilitate exploration of the Zimbabwean citrus, fruits and other products to China. China aims to increase its export scope to strengthen their comprehensive strategic partnership for economic cooperation. Beryl Oro, CGTN. And back to South Africa now. Jimmy Botha, a black South African farmer, is exactly what the government is foreseeing when he talks of empowering black people in the country. Now, the government plans to ensure that they are directly drawn and involved in farming. CGTN's Yolisa Njamela has his story. When Jimmy Botha joined the farming world, he hardly knew where to begin. Botha tells us that he was born to be a man of the soil. But it took him half a lifetime to sink his roots into what he truly loves. Botta is a kale and spinach farmer. Before this enterprise, he ran his own telecommunications company. The business failed, and the idea of farming, a long-held dream of his, began to hold more appeal. He then met an American property developer who was in South Africa looking to invest in land. The two entered into a partnership. At the time, the infrastructure of the farm was extremely poor. So I came here and I looked at this place. It was just a burnt piece of land. Uh, out there and, and I thought, you know, out of desperation, I just said, well, I'll do it. Well, there's a house, there's water, there's electricity, and uh, there's four people living here as well, uh, old farm workers. So I took, I, I took on the offer and uh, we started. His willingness and determination paid off. From the onset I came here and I thought to myself, you know, people come into industries and into uh, operations with, with that excitement and uh, they will maybe say one thing now and as soon as they see things go good or bad, uh, then they change the status quo, you know, they change about how they think. But I was very consistent with this. Porter plants the herbs all year round, with the exception of the basil. Basil is sensitive to cold, so he doesn't cultivate it in winter. Bota is now one of the suppliers to one of the leading retail companies in South Africa, Woolworths. He also supplies his products to a number of fruit and veg stores around Gauteng. There's a customer of mine, a customer that I'm very, very passionate about in Johannesburg. They call themselves uh, Impala, Impala Fruit in, in, in Notliff. That was my first customer. I went to him, I showed him my, 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 my sample, and uh, he said, bring the stuff. I brought the stuff, and that is how it went. I went from, you know, cold canvassing. I went from green grocer to green grocer, and uh, that is how my, my, my journey went there. The farmer's youngest daughter will soon qualify as an agronomist. 
He wants her and her sibling to take over. I want it to go from generation to generation and all that. You know, I don't just want to farm here. Yeah? And as I'm saying is, right now, is the farm is developed. You, you know, not fully developed and all that. And there is where all my money goes. I don't, uh, that is what I decided. I don't want the money to, you know, to be for myself and all that. I, I'm farming for the future, you know, and uh, that, is my, that is my thing. Porter's success represent an outstanding example to emerging farmers in South Africa. Ulysses and Jamela for City to end in Mahalispec, South Africa. Well, that's all for now on Africa Live Biz. But coming up on Global Business Africa, FMCG firm Tiger Brand suffers a major setback. That's after victims of the deadly Listeria outbreak get a green light to file a lawsuit. Of course, all that coming up top of the hour for now. Back to you, Beatrice. Uche, thank you. And we still have more news for you here on the program. Here's what's ahead. East Africa's biggest fashion show has wrapped up in Dar es Salaam. That story and plenty more after the break. When you look at Africa, what do you really see? Do you see fast-growing, endless deserts and parched earth? Or do you see the biggest opportunity for an agricultural revolution in a generation? Do you see crowded, unplanned cities or vast, untapped markets? Do you see a population at risk or do you see a billion strong opportunity to grow the next wave of multi-billion dollar firms in Africa? When you look at Africa, what do you really see? Join us in global business and see Africa through our eyes. The greatest journeys. The greatest sights. The greatest adventures. Here in Panata, this weir allows the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. To bring you stories of struggle, survival and hope. Ah. Ah. So let's explore. CGTN. See the difference. And let's go to Tanzania now, where East Africa's biggest fashion event, Swahili Fashion Week, was on this past weekend in Dar es Salaam, with designers, investors, models and fans taking to the National Museum. Here's CGTN's Daniel Kijo. The runway, amazing designs, and awards are just some of the ingredients that Taylor make one of East Africa's biggest fashion events. Internationally known and one of this year's award winners, Martin Kadinda, says this is more than just a show. So it's, it's a way of being um, diplomatic to connect African people to one stage and showcase our creativity. For over a decade, the show emphasizes to the region that fashion is an income-generating creative industry. Meanwhile, promoting a made-in-Africa concept. This is 11th annual Swahili Fashion Week, and each year there's a central area of focus. Then this time round, the theme is the Swahili language and its promotion. With over 40 designers present this year, it acts as a platform for up-and-coming designers in the region. Designers like Bijou Trends and others aim to push East African products into African diaspora markets. She has tried to incorporate some Swahili and our, our national, our, tourist, our tourism attractions like Serengeti. So I can see she has tried to, co to accommodate the culture, the Swahili language within her outfits. Created by celebrated Pan-African Couture from Tanzania, Mustafa Sanali in the year 2008, the longevity of the show is not absent of challenges. What different can we do, number one? Number two, how do we involve more support from development partners, government and the corporate, you know? For now, organizers and designers regroup and go back to the drawing board till next year. Their goal is the same to make Swahili Fashion Week 
the most sought after and preferred fashion platform in Africa for the international market. Daniel Kijo, CGTN, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. A premature baby unit at a hospital in Uganda is spearheading a move to build the country's first breast milk bank. A scheme to allow more women to donate their breast milk is underway. Premature birth is one of the leading causes of neonatal mortality in Uganda. The founders of this initiative hope to change that one pump at a time. CGTN's Tudisha Balala has more. It's 11 a.m. at the neonatal intensive care unit at Nsambia Hospital in Kampala. Bayarugaba Jones carefully cleans her breast, ready for a donation session. This has been her routine for over a year now. She gives vital breast milk for premature babies here. Most of the babies in this unit have either been abandoned or their mothers have failed to produce the vital breast milk that is required for their survival. There are so many babies that are born prematurely. They need this milk. There are so many mothers who even produce well and the milk just disappears. So let us look at the lives of these children. Victoria Nakibuka is behind the piloting of this initiative. The first time we did it was for, because of a mother that was very, very sick, admitted in the ICU for three weeks, and the baby was also sick. The baby was 1.2 kilos. So we had to get donated express milk, express milk for that baby, and the baby was able to survive, and this baby actually survived. Another time we did it was a mother that had four babies, that were born at six months and about three weeks. This baby is fed on breast milk and actually the baby really survived. The babies are now two years. This fridge is all the hospital has to keep the donated milk for future use. But it is not enough. The hospital is in a process of having a permanent bank that will store excess milk. Because the number of babies that need the donated breast milk are increasing, we thought we need to get a proper bank where we can have a proper pasteurizer, a proper fridge and proper storage for this, for this milk because the milk is always, and it's, it's always there, it's always available. Human breast milk is vital for infants. It provides powerful nutritional, immunological protection and reduces mortality from infectious diseases. Globally, the promotion of exclusive breastfeeding is seen as an important public health priority. But when a mother's own breast milk is not available, the World Health Organization recommends donated human breast milk as the best alternative. To Lishabalal, CGTN. Stay with us as we still have more news for you here on the program. Here's what's coming up. In sports, Kenyan football gets a lift after the team confirms a place at the 2019 Africa Cup of Nations finals following a 14-year wait. Africa, where champions are made, records are broken, legends are born. We're there for every goal, for every knockout, for every step of the way. Match point, only on CGTN. And let's begin your sport with football. It is now official. Kenyan football fans can now celebrate after their national team, Harambe Stars, confirmed qualification for the 2019 Africa Cup of Nations slated for the June 15th to July the 11th. This is after the Confederation of African Football confirmed that Sierra Leone was disqualified from the qualifiers last Friday following an extraordinary executive committee meeting in Accra, Ghana. The West African nation is also suspended from all football activities by the world governing body FIFA due to government interference. This is the first time Kenya is making the final since their appearance in the 2004 edition hosted by Tunisia. 
And still in football, the annual Ballon d'Or award winners are set to be announced on Monday with Croatia's Luka Modric, a favourite to add the accolade to his FIFA World Player of the Year award. Real Madrid midfielder Modric led his national team Croatia all the way to the World Cup final, bagging the Golden Ball award in the process. Real teammate and World Cup winner Rafael Varani, PSG and French star Kylian Mbappe, as well as five-time winner Cristiano Ronaldo, all pose a threat to Modric. The event will also be seeing the inaugural Ballon d'Or awarded to a female footballer this year. Barcelona and Dutch striker Lieke Martins is one of the women in the contention for the prize awarded by France Football Magazine. To European football now, Netherlands and Germany were grouped together in qualification for the 2020 European Championship at Sunday's draw in Dublin. Germany will also play Northern Ireland, Estonia and Belarus in Group C when the qualification competition begins in March. Hold us Portugal must face Ukraine and Serbia in a tricky five-team Group B, which also includes Lithuania and Luxembourg, while, while world champions France drew Iceland and Turkey in Group H. Elsewhere, three times champions Spain were drawn in Group F with Sweden, Norway and Romania. England faced the Czech Republic and Bulgaria in Group A. The top two teams from each group qualify automatically. The 2020 finals will be held across 12 cities as a celebration of the competition's 60th anniversary. Certainly there are some obvious countries we could have drawn that we've avoided, the likes of Germany in pot two and Serbia and a couple of others in pot three. So, um, But um, yeah, we've got high motivation to get to these finals. We are potentially one of the host cities and uh, well we are one of the host cities so we've got to make sure that we're there. The UEFA Executive Committee announced on Monday that video assistant referees VAR will be introduced in the Champions League as from the round of 16 in February of UEFA Euro 2020 in the 2020-2021 UEFA Europa League as from the group stage onwards and in the 2021 UEFA Nations League finals. And we'll leave it there on this edition of Africa Live. Remember, you can send your feedback to the contact on your screen and follow us on our digital media platform. Thank you for watching. I'm Beatrice Marshall in Nairobi. From me and the team here on Africa Live, bye-bye. Uche Okoronko is up next with Global Business Africa. See you later.